by the grace of God, I was able to accumulate a fortune of over $2 billion with Pelosi. At one point, it was actually $4 billion. Our stock price is a little bit down, and it might be back there someday again. And uh, I'm actually doing well in the movie business right now, so that might actually add to my fortune. Uh, and what I'm doing to subtract from my fortune is to give it away. My name is Steve Sarowitz. I am founder of Paylocity, a, a global HR and payroll company, uh, publicly held. I am also uh, the co-founder and co-chairman of Wayfair Studios. I, I would describe myself as an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, and a movie maker. Uh, my philanthropy is the Wayfair Foundation as well as the Julian Grace Foundation. My goal is to give away the great majority of my fortune uh, during my living years and actually by my early 70s. I'm 58 right now, and I'd like to uh, uh, like to give away the great majority of my fortune by my mid-70s, early to mid-70s, and then just live on a small fraction of it the rest of my life. My goal is to to kind of do this while I'm alive, to do as much good for the world as possible. I don't believe it makes sense to have, uh, as a Baha'i, I don't believe it makes sense to have extremes of wealth and poverty. So my goal is not to accumulate a fortune and just keep it and have a yacht. My goal is to accumulate a fortune, actually not even to accumulate a fortune, I happen to have accumulated a fortune, but to take this fortune I've accumulated and use it in the service of humanity. And then in terms of businesses, the, every new business that I invest in or start in is generally also for the good of humanity as well. So I, I'm investing in things that both in the nonprofit and for-profit world, which are in line with my Baha'i faith and the oneness of humanity. What I think long-term, what philanthropy should be doing is looking at the things that are at the core of the problems of humanity. I believe that we are primarily spiritual beings and that the primary causes of our problems and the solutions to our problems are in the spiritual realm, not as much in the physical realm. I think we should focus in terms of philanthropy on the spiritual um, as, as a really a root of the physical. And so it's not to say we shouldn't feed the hungry or, or, or give housing to the homeless, but we should look at the reasons how we got here and try to look at those underlying reasons. So, we're not continually on this hamster wheel of trying to, to fix the problems without ever trying to solve them. We have a society which is out of balance. We have racism, we have sexism, we have nationalism, we have religious prejudice, we have war, we have greed, we have corruption. And so these human failings are at the root of human problems. So if you look at the world today and, and realize how much money, and especially now is a good time to say it this week, how much money is going into war, how much money is going into greed and corruption. And you take, if you took that money and, and invested it to, in the betterment of society, it would help us tremendously materially. Um, you know, if you look at the imbalances, the inequities in the world, these things are things that we could, that we need to address. And instead of just giving someone a, a meal for the day, why, can't they afford a meal on their own? What is what is stopping them from being productive or from being paid for their production? So again, looking at all the problems um, from more the source of the problem rather than here's the problem. Um, I recently went to uh, Clinton Global uh, Global Health Initiative and a lot of well-meaning people and they talked about, well, there's a war in Sudan, there's a war in Ukraine and these people were hurt by the war. and But they never asked why was there a war? They just said, these people are, let's help the people hurt by the war. But I'm looking and saying, why did the war start? What are the, what are the root causes of war? And that's what I'm trying to, to address with my philanthropy. Generally, um, I like to find people who are already working for the betterment of humanity. We, we invest most of our money, the, the Wayfair Foundation invests most of its money in community-based organizations. So we're already, we're, we already find people who are, we find people who are already doing good work in their communities and then we invest in them. But we aren't looking, not to say that we don't want to change people's minds, we do, but I think that we want to get the biggest bang for our buck. And we'll get that by working with, with people that are already working and doing positive things. Um, we could spend a lot of time, it's like partisan politics, I could try to convince someone that this candidate is better than the other. 
but that's a lot of time invested and I'm not sure you get the uh, result from that, uh, that investment. What would be your advice to companies and leaders in business organizations who are talking about building culture and community? It's such a trendy word right now. So maybe it's more of a trend that they're trying to get on versus is it something that they can incorporate into their corporate ethos. But when they hear the word spirituality or spiritual capitalism, they have a big pushback and issue with that. So maybe we don't use that word. Religion has become a word that we can't use because religion has so often been misused. I didn't realize that spirituality is as bad as religion, but perhaps it is. Um, but maybe we, we talk about spirituality and we say, well, what is spiritual? Do we need virtuous? Do we need virtues? Because spirituality is really uh, based in virtues. Uh, spirituality, uh, you know, the, the, the fruits of spirituality are love and kindness and mercy and compassion and truth and justice. And if we go to the spiritual virtues, that should hopefully be less controversial. So if we find a particular word to be controversial, I, I recently spoke at Columbia University and I asked how many people are religious, raise your hand, um, about three people in a, in a I think it was about 70 people, maybe five to eight people. So let's say 90% of the room was not spirit, was not religious. And how many people are spiritual but not religious? The majority of the room. So I think there's a lot of people who are okay with spirituality and not religion. And there's probably a lot of people who are okay with spiritual ideas, but not the, the idea of spirituality or religion. So if you just take out the words that are offending them, but you take the substance of what you were going to talk about anyway and leave that in, perhaps so, you know, it, it becomes, um, you know, the the humanist movement where basically I, I like, I don't like God, but I like humans, which is kind of funny to me, you know, like because we're created by God in my mind. But, you know, so we, we, we go where people, get, I guess, can understand it. You may not be able to give them the exact words you were going to use, but you can give... The idea is to advance the world as much as you can within the context of what you're allowed to say. When I first became a Baha'i, I would have said that, that there's business on one hand, which is bad, and religion, which is good, and the two don't mix. And so I decided I'm going to give up on business, and I'm going to go just do Baha'i. I'm going to teach the Baha'i faith, and that's all I'm going to do. As I've matured as a Baha'i as a Baha and as a human being over the last nine years, I've realized that I can do good in business as well. Impact investing is one way. Um, working, actually starting companies up directly is another way. But you're really asking, you know, is, is making money and being spiritual and diametrically opposed? And the answer is no. Um, one of the uh, things you talked about impact investing, part, you know, a lot of impact investing in America is investing in minorities, which would be uh, women and people of color. If you invest in women and people of color, it's a very smart business decision because these are underinvested areas. Um, a business that that uh, that that operates in a loving, kind, just, and ethical environment is going to do business better on average every time than a business that is corrupt. Now, in the short run. Businesses that are corrupt, businesses that are harsh, um, and, and this dog-eat-dog -dog world may do better. But Hollywood's a great example. So I'm in Hollywood right now, and the next time someone asks about that, um, I have a friend who works for, who actually is one of the investors in Angel Studios, and what he said, which I agree with, is Hollywood has a double negative bottom line. They make movies that are bad for our souls, and they're losing a lot of money. Now, Wayfair Studios has a double positive bottom line. And guess what? Wayfair Studios right now has, I think, three of the top streaming movies at right now as we speak. Three of the top streaming movies in in, in the world right now. Will and Harper. Uh, it ends with us and Garfield. We're investors in Garfield as well. And so if you make movies that are for good, you can actually do good. And we, um, it ends with us, by the way, is the number one original movie in the world this year in the box office. And now everyone's coming to us because now we've got not what not one but three successes this year, and and we had Ezra, which was a very great critical success as well. And we've got other movies as, as well in the in the hopper. It's it's not a question of what you say you do, but how do you do it? So I think for an organization, I think the most important thing is to is to be very public with your values, 
Number two, have training on those values. Mm -hmm. I don't think you, you don't just say it. You say it, you train on it, and then you manage to it. And then you deal with the problems that even occur when you do it with the best of intentions. I don't care if someone doesn't like me because I'm too religious or because I'm too passionate about my faith. My faith is about the oneness of humanity and world peace. And that's ultimately what I'm there to do is to help make the world a more unified and happier uh, and peaceful place. And if I'm unable to do that, maybe some of that's my fault. But if someone doesn't like that, that's okay with me. Then they, they're against peace and unity. That's okay. It's one of two things. Either I've presented it wrong, which is very possible, and I'm sure I do that all the time, or people, some people don't like peace and unity, and that's okay. But I'm still going to tell the next person about peace and unity because I, we need this. We need this message spread. I think, and I try to walk, and I'm, I fail, of course, because I'm not Abdul Baha, but I try to walk through the world with these virtues every day. So I try to walk through the world with with honesty. I try to work walk to walk through the world with integrity, with kindness. And I really work hard on that. And you know, one of my challenges this year has been to avoid backbiting. We had uh we had a very difficult uh challenge while we we're making it ends with us. And so one of my challenges was to really never talk badly about anyone, despite what they may or may not be doing. And that's so I'm I'm you know, I'm tested. I'm not perfect, but the goal is to walk in the ways of Abdul Baha, who demonstrated these virtues perfectly every day. And so my goal is always tomorrow to be a little bit better than today and to reflect these virtues every time I walk through the world. And I don't think they should change between the personal life and the professional life. I think uh, to Carrie's point, if you're not walking with these virtues, then you know you can say anything you want. You can call it Baha'i inspired, but unless you're walking with these virtues, it's not Baha'i inspired and it's not Christian or Jewish or any other faith as well. So we are studying, as far as the Wayfair Foundation, we're studying the Baha'i writings every day. And we also are consulting with the uh, National Spiritual Assembly and the Universal House of Justice as we give away money. And the same thing with um, Wayfair Studios. We've consulted with the National Spiritual Assembly on several occasions because we want to make sure the work we're doing is in line with the tenets of the Baha'i faith. So I, I draw all the time, um, you know, Laura Herrick, who runs the Wafer Foundation is Baha'i. Justin and Jamie and I are all Baha'is and we have other Baha'is who work throughout the organizations. Um, and so we are studying the faith, we're studying the writings and we're trying to walk in those writings every day. Spirituality and religion, you know, that teaches you divine virtues. Now it doesn't mean that you can't be a good person without spirituality or religion. Um, I think though, as you get into what spirituality actually is, spirituality is love and kindness and mercy and compassion and truth and justice and all the divine virtues. And so if you are not predisposed to those virtues, you cannot raise the level of your business. Sometimes we have understand we have a, a, a trouble with words. Spirituality is yes. those. And so there are a lot of people who are spiritual, but not religious. But if you have no inclination towards either spirituality or religion, there's no way you can raise the bar. If you say, look, I don't like religion. Religion has been harmful to me, but I like love and kindness and mercy and compassion and truth and justice. Then you would be spiritual and not religious. And that is okay. Why do I advocate for religion? Why am I myself a religious person? And I say it this way, um, that I don't believe in the religion, if you are not religious, that you don't believe in. I don't believe in a religion that that is harsh and intolerant and has um, very judgmental. I don't believe in a religion that advocates for that goes against logic, reason, and science. I don't believe in religion that is superstitious or unjust. Um, and I don't believe in religion that creates division and conflict. What I do believe so, in love and kindness, mercy, compassion, truth and justice, all the virtues I keep mentioning. Religion without love and kindness and mercy and compassion, that type of religion that creates conflict should be done away with. However, if we do away with religion entirely, we lose the vessel for spirituality. And so if you don't have the religious, as you mentioned, moral code, which is actually very important, 
If you don't have the moral code that religion gives us, if you don't have the structure that religion gives us, we eventually devolve into superstition as well. So I've been on, I tried on Facebook when I first became a Baha'i, a couple of groups that were spiritual and not religious. And I was shocked by how little spirituality there was. And what happened is the spirituality, which has no vessel. So another way to say it is that spirituality is the heart of any religion. And a religion without spirituality is like a dead body. But if you pull the heart from the body, the heart also dies. And so what religion does, and I am particularly enamored of the Baha'i faith, if I, if I were to take away the Baha'i writings and say, I'm just going to try to do good, I would not be as effective. My businesses would not be as effective. So the, the, the religious writings, the word of God, is really important when you're talking about spirituality and when you're talking about morality. The word of God very much helps. It's, it's a great guidance. I find it to be a great guidance to myself and my organizations. I am struggling to understand this idea which you touched on, which is you don't solve war or you don't solve problems with a Band-Aid, right? What's the root? And I, I, I am unable to find those who are digging deep enough to address the systemic, the roots, right? So I, I come from healthcare, I come from education, and we keep spending billions and billions of dollars and the same problems exist today that, that did when I was starting in this nonprofit work 35 years ago. So I understand the, vir the virtues, right? I understand and I live by, I, I don't, I, I am losing faith that philanthropy is really addressing those root problems. I agree with you, Candice. So number one, I agree with you, <laughs> no, mostly, but it's like anything else. You know, I, I, I look at the movies that are being made and I don't like 80% of them. I went to CinemaCon and 80% of the movies, this is about six months ago, and 80% of the movies they put out there, I literally would run from the theater to avoid. They're violent. But then there's beautiful movies that are being made. We, You know, our movie Ezra was my favorite. We have another movie called Code 3, which we can't get out yet, but we were going to try with Rain Wilson. Um, I think Will and Harper, which which is... I think it's a beautiful movie uh, with Will Ferrell. So philanthropy is the same way. There's a lot of nonprofits that are being run in a corrupt manner, that are being run in, you'd say, old world order manner, and that they're they're very top down. They're not helping the communities. They're prescriptive rather than consultative. I think that there are philanthropists who do what Wayfair does and Julian Grace. And, and actually, that's a little different because there is some differences between them. But and there's also philanthropists who are more traditional. Interestingly enough, the traditionalists are starting to come to Wayfair and say, what are you doing? You're different. Why are you different? Why do you look different? Why do you sound different? Why, why, do, why do we keep hearing your name? So if you do this, if you continue, so it may feel like you're a voice in the wilderness at first, but as you go forth and you stick to your guns and you do it, yes, it'll be lonely at times. I, I, I've heard of many stories like a, uh, there's one of my favorite stories is about a Baha'i woman who wanted to spread the faith in this new place and was completely a failure and went and prayed every day and no one came and no one listened and it was just terrible. And then 20 years later went back and there was a thriving Baha'i community. The mm -hmm. prayers had been answered. And I think that's how everything works. It's our job to endeavor. It's our job to try, even if we fail. Even if we're Don Quixote swinging, I always, I often describe myself as Don Quixote swinging at windmills, even if I've hit a few windmills and injured them. But uh, I, I'm my next thing in Hollywood because everything in Hollywood is broken is to get into distribution and marketing of films because I have good films. We even, even the Wafers had a very good year. We have good films that either haven't done well or we can't even get out. And so there's you're going to have the same problem with philanthropy. You're going to have the same problem with for-profit and non-for-profit businesses. We live in a world that is spiritually not aligned, that is not run in the nature of love and kindness and mercy and compassion and truth and justice. And to Carrie's point, even if you try, you're going to fail sometimes. But as I think, Carrie, you might agree with this, that failure or quote-unquote failure is more like tribulation that we need in order to learn. What I'm really saying is, I think our job is to try. Our job, 
Candace, even on those days when it seems dark, our job is to keep trying. And there are people who are operating like Wayfair outside of Wayfair. And if you want to reach out to Wayfair and ask for other foundations, Wayfair would be happy to do that. I know it seems dark at times. <laughs> we're, we're at this time right now, and that's probably interesting for humanity. We're at this inflection point where it's going to get really dark and it's going to get it's going to get darker. And we just have to hold the faith and say, no, the, the light is coming and the light is already here. We just have to keep keep in that light, even when it seems dim. The way we make decisions at Wayfair Studios is very consultative. So Jamie has ideas and experiences, and Justin has ideas and experiences, and we have other members on our team. Brian, our CFO, um, Tara, our president, and we we get in a room together, and we talk about it. And I remember I was at a conference. It was a, a conference of wealthy, mainly Jewish people. I was actually unusual that I was a Baha'i there. And one guy got on and said, well, I'm, I take care of distressed businesses, and we get in a room, and we yell at each other. And, so we figure it out and we figure it out. We do very well. I said, well, I said that might work. And that sounds like it's worked very well for you. We actually have been very successful and we don't yell. And he got so mad at me for saying that, but it was true. I wanted people to hear that you don't have to do that. So you don't have to. So consultation, you know, let go of that idea. As soon as it leaves your mouth, it's not your idea. Now it doesn't mean that there can't be some hierarchy. Ultimately I can pull rank on Jamie and Jamie because he's the CEO, but I'm the co-chairman. It's my money. Ultimately, I could say, Jamie, we're not going to do that. But part of consultation is, is letting your people fly, even if you disagree with them. Um, an example of this, um, when I, with Paylocity, I brought in a, a, a Steve Beauchamp, who's now chairman. I'm, I'm just founder now. He's taken away the chairman title. Um, but Steve Beauchamp, I brought in as president, and I brought, and then he brought in a, a, a VP of sales, Mike Kasky. And it's been a great relationship. It's 17 years and counting for both of them. I'm just investing in, Mike has left and I'm investing in his new company. But when they came in, I was, my company, Paylocity, we were in maybe 10, 12, maybe more trade shows a year. And we were very proud of that. And we thought that was very good. And Steve and Mike looked at it and said, nope, we don't make money from that. These trade shows are a waste of time and money. We don't want to do them right now. And they stopped all of them, including the Illinois CPA show, which we'd had a great relationship with for years. And so I could have said, look, guys, it's my money. I own the company. You guys are just running it. I'm, you know, we're going to do it my way, my way or the highway. But I said, OK, look, I hired you guys for your expertise. You know about this and let's try it. We tried it. I don't know if it was the right decision. It might have been the wrong decision, but it was the right decision for me to let them do it. We're back at trade shows now partially so that, you know, after I think they also and I kind of understood this at the time felt that they had other things to focus on at that time. And they come back to it later, which they did. But again, what I didn't do was say, this is my idea. I love these trade shows, which I did. And I can't, you know, you can't do it a different way. I think when you're running a company, part of it is you, you empower your people. And you allow them to make mistakes. When I was younger, when I was 25 years old, I was the opposite of that. I, I was the most top-down hierarchical boss you could ever imagine. I owned a little Chinese restaurant. And I, I, will, I will publicly apologize to anyone who had to work with me uh, that, the 30 years ago, 30, 30 plus years ago, because I would yell at them, scream at them, push them out, literally, physically, I'm six foot six, push them out of the way and say, no, you don't know what you're doing. I don't think I injured anyone, but I was just, you know, very much, I could do it better and you don't know what you're doing. And that is the opposite of what you want to do. What you want to do is really have a collaborative approach. So ask people what their opinions are. Listen to them. Listen very well. And even if you're at the top now at the top, you can take all this collaboration and consultation and ultimately make a decision. And I was watching the movie Invincible uh, yesterday morning with my dad, who's staying with me. And uh, Invincible is about uh, Vince. What's his last name? Vince Papale, who makes the Philadelphia Eagles. And there's a scene in there where Dick Vitale, Dick, Dick Vermeil, who's the coach, says. Um, his wife says to him, well, Everyone else wants to do it this way. And, uh, but you're the boss, aren't you? And you can, you can pull rank. And he did pull rank and ended up bringing Vince on the team. And it worked out very well for him. So there are times where I might pull rank, even in, a, even in consultation. But for the most part, you want to be able to listen because nine of us are smarter than one of us or, or five of us are smarter than one of us. I want to say that Wayfair Studios has been running a consultative manner for the last couple of years. 
we're thriving. Uh, it's and it's so enjoyable to to be in this atmosphere with, you know, the, my attitude on working with Jamie and Justin and also Tara, our president, is not only do I enjoy working with them, I don't care. I mean, I obviously want to be successful, but I would rather be unsuccessful with them than be successful with people I don't like. I adore them. And like, you know, I've told Jamie, I've told just Jamie or Justin this, you know, Jamie, sorry, Justin is a very talented actor and director. And, you know, if I said, Justin, if you're never in another movie or never direct another movie, I still want to be your business partner. And Justin has said to me, if you lose all your money, I'll still be your business partner. That's, you know, you want to have love between people running the business. And that's what we have. I, I absolutely adore my partners and enjoy working with them. And that's what consultation um, and, and a shared faith really leads you to. There's so many things society needs. So start a business, for example, I think with the movies. I think society needs good movies. So there's a need there. There's so many people who tell me, yeah, why aren't there good movies? Well, we can make them. Now we have to get through all the corrupt things to get them even shown, but we'll do that. So anything you do, make sure there's a need for it. Use your head and your heart in equal measures. Don't just use your head and forget to love. Don't just love and forget to think. Do both. And never, ever abandon your values.